meet you all. My name, my name is Joe Campagna. I'm just going to take one minute to say got it on that recording notice. And do you know what, Joe, I'm going to jump in and I'm just going to say so that we have a clean screen is just to say, hi, I'm Tyler Crone. This is the 36th Legislative District. We're so delighted to be interviewing Joe Campagna tonight for Superior Court. Over to you, Joe, to introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's nice to meet you all. I'm one of your 54 Superior Court judges in King County. I was appointed by Governor Inslee last August to this role. It's an honor to be here to meet you all tonight. It's an honor to seek your support. So a little bit about me prior to this role. I was a judge on the King County District Court since the start of 2019. I did run for election in 2018 and was fortunate to win that race with the support of a number of union groups and legislative district democratic organizations. Uh, prior to that, I was a lawyer at a small firm in Seattle representing people who had either been injured or who had been charged with crimes. That's sort of my basic background. But I think what's more important and probably more meaningful for you all is just a few comments about my values. I really think that as a judge, we have an absolute duty uh, to treat everybody who walks into court with respect and dignity and to give our absolute best to every single case. When I was running for office in 2018, I had an opportunity to meet with thousands of people, knocked on a lot of doors. And it really struck me how so many people had a strong view of the court, either positive or frequently negative, based on one limited interaction, maybe even from decades ago, because for judges, what might be a minor thing that you forget about five minutes later is a very important thing for somebody who's in court. So we have a duty to remember that. If anybody who's there, this is maybe one of the biggest events of their life and it's memorable. I think we also have a duty to work to make the whole system better. When I was at the district court, I did that through starting the the, the community core program in Shoreline, which helps link people up with services when they're caught in the revolving door of, of jail and being unhoused in court. Uh, it was extremely satisfying to do that. And I hope to bring those same values to bear at the Superior Court. Thank you. Thank you so much. The first question this evening will be asked by Toby. Over to you, Toby. What is your understanding of access to justice and what steps are you taking to promote and foster it? Thank you. I think that that, um, that true access to justice is obviously more than just being able to walk into the courtroom. It's the social capital, the emotional capital, the economic capital to access all facets of the justice system. Uh, that presents itself as challenges in a number of ways. Some people have simply just an inability to even get to court or to appear in court based on economics or transportation. What I've been doing to help address that is to push hard, especially since COVID, for expanded Zoom video options for folks to appear in court. There was actually a significant amount of pushback to that from the court. It's a big change. The court doesn't like change. I could see right from the start that it was an enormous benefit for people to be able to appear in court from a job site, from their home, sometimes even from a tent, you know, but just letting people do that and then move on with their lives is a big deal. There's an opportunity that folks have to have to understand what's even going on in court. Sometimes that's a language barrier. Sometimes it's just you're not familiar with the process. So I've done, um, tried to make sure that that everyone who's in court, and we'll talk about this a little later, uh, has access to, to language options while they're in court, also has access to forms that are translated into their language. That's a big challenge. That costs a lot of money, but it's something that's, that's a serious barrier to a lot of people to being able to access services. Um, similarly, the opportunity to sort of understand how to use the levers of, of court. Uh, uh, it's a very complicated system for people who are who are not lawyers. So I've tried to um, make sure that uh, folks have an equal footing. When I was a lawyer, frankly, through working at a lot of legal clinics, uh, some at, uh, at the El Centro de la Raza facility on Beacon Hill, just to help people understand what kind of problem do you have and where do you even go? You know, these are all sort of interconnected things that, um, that uh, we need to be mindful of both as lawyers and as judges. And I've tried hard to work on all of those avenues. Thank you so much. The second question this evening will be asked by Amanda. Amanda. Hi. What are you doing or what will you do to make newcomers or those whose primary language is not English or those without legal status 
Feel comfortable in your courtroom. Describe the steps you will take to ensure that their right to due process is protected. Absolutely. So I'm going to start with the last part, because in terms of people's legal status, that's actually something that judges will rarely, if ever, know. It's sort of a red line that I can't really cross to ask people what their legal status is. That's a That would be like, um, you know, there's rights that somebody has to not answer those kind of questions in court, and it would be a serious mis- step for a judge to ask somebody in open court, are you here with papers or something like that? So I usually don't know unless it's hinted around at the edges. Um, there's certain sort of sort of key phrases that I might know that might tip me off. But you know, the language one is a big deal. We use translators for over a hundred languages in King County. We seek out languages from all over the world, sometimes minor languages, sometimes with relay languages where we have to first translate from like a native language into a more common language and then from the more common language into English. It's just a fundamental due process obligation of the courts to make sure that everybody who's in court can understand what's going on. You know, again, if we were to violate that, it it, it, it would be foolish for a judge because a case could be reversed and it just wouldn't be right. So we need to make sure, um, you know, we always ask if somebody seems like they, don't quite understand and we need to make sure that we keep asking. It just came up for me the other day, actually, somebody who's a defendant from El Salvador seeking interpretation in Spanish. We got those, they were certified, they're qualified, but their uh, their accent wasn't quite right. And so actually this person couldn't understand even somebody who was qualified. So we need to keep checking in and making sure. And then when there's an issue, we had to recess court for a full day to find somebody else that was an imposition kind of on our timeline, but it's just what you have to do. It's a baseline that you can't shortcut and you need to make sure that uh, folks who are there uh, feel comfortable asking that and, um, and are afforded with all the opportunities that they need to be able to understand what's going on. Thank you. Jasmine will ask the next question. Jasmine. You can just get these all queued up. Sorry. Jasmine's uh, also helping us with timing. So yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks for the buffer. Uh, can you tell us about a rec- about a recent decision of the Washington Supreme Court that addresses racism? Are there steps courts can take to address racism or implicit bias in our court system in process? Thank you. I need more than two minutes, but I'm going to have to talk really fast. There's been a lot of action on this front at the Supreme Court of Washington level lately, first with GR 37, which dramatically changed the way that we pick juries in terms of the focus. The focus is no longer on whether the prosecutor did something racist, because that was often very difficult to show. And now it's on whether an objective observer, knowing the full history of racism in this country could view race as a factor. So there's a number of changes there, each of which has had a huge impact on the way that we pick juries. And that exact same standard has been broadened out in a number of other contexts. Also in State v. Some recently, that was used as the new standard to assess whether somebody has been seized by you know, an officer. This is search and seizure law that's used every day in courts across the whole country. It used to be just what would a reasonable person think. And now it's what would an objective observer who's conscious of this history think, which is a big, big change. Um, Similarly, in the case of Henderson v. Thompson, the court here also brought that even civil cases now, which is a big change also. What would an objective observer, could they think that race was a factor in a civil case? And they reversed a substantial civil case and sent it back because the court didn't do the right kind of fact finding. Now that case, Uh, the losing party has petitioned for cert to the Supreme Court of the U.S. and it's kind of rattling around with uh, some amicus briefs from the Chamber of Commerce and so forth. And, you know, if the Supreme Court takes that up, I don't, we'll see what happens. I don't know that I'd be super optimistic if this court takes up that issue, Um, but we'll see. And so there's been a real sea change in the types of, in the types of analyses that are done. Washington is a leader. Um, I don't think any other state in the whole country has done the kind of things that this court has here to change the way that we analyze race in our cases, both criminal and civil. Thank you so much. And the final prepared question will be asked by Brittany. Brittany, over to you. How much time do you give to educating the public about our courts, either a percentage of time or hours per month? Uh, It could include teaching in schools or talking to community groups. Thank you. You know, it varies widely right now. At this point, I am 
you know, going to a lot of events and talking to a lot of folks. And partly that's just, you know, the filing year for me. Um, in the past, I was very involved at the district court level in all of our outreach efforts where we'd go pre-COVID, of course, to all the, um, the community events, the sort of neighborhood parties, the, you know, cultural festivals. And we'd set up a little table. We'd talk to anybody who wanted to talk. I, I love talking about these things, but I mean, I'll be honest, it's probably a weak point for me. I think I need to do more outreach. You get very busy with work and life and family. It's easy to, um, to not do as much outreach as you should. I sign up for all the things that happen. We just had a middle school class come through and watch court. Unfortunately, it's a really serious rape case that didn't seem real appropriate for middle schoolers, but they were there and, um, you know, they, uh, they got to see how things go, but I do need to do more outreach to share how the court system works. There's a serious deficit in trust that's well-deserved, I think, for our courts right now, just with the way things are going at, at the national level and showing people how we take issues seriously, how we are very careful in trying to apply the law and to be fair to everyone, I think is a necessary civic you know, education step uh, to keep our system strong. But I don't know that I could put an average time on it right now because it does vary a lot. Thank you so much. We will now move to follow-up questions from our e-board. Toby. I'm gonna take you off in a different direction, I think. It's a simple question. Should trees have standing? Should trees have standing? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I guess in a sense, you know, somebody comes into court and they have to have standing to bring a dispute. I have heard of people trying to file on behalf of, of animals and, and things or trying to, to leverage it into um, to sort of a broader natural resources type issue. I think it might be difficult to do that in some ways, just because who's going to speak for the trees other than, you know, the Lorax, I guess. But um, I do think that that natural resources and say the air and the climate should be given some kind of expanded standing consideration perhaps in the future. I know that there's been some climate litigation that's tried to get off the ground that's kind of run into challenges like that, but you run into otherwise the tragedy of the commons type problems, I think where, you know, if, um, nobody can, I guess, speak for the trees, I guess you say, and then nobody is. And so that could be a problem. But I'd, I'd have to give it a little more thought on how that would work. It sounds a little tricky. Thanks for your answer. Thank you. I think we're having a clock issue. Um, so I will move to my phone for timing and see if anyone has more follow-ups. Does, oh, Judy. I said, I said, I, I'll, I'll ask one if nobody else has a question. Please do go for it. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Zoom. What's kind of, uh, uh, you know, that that is good thing for people to be able to attend by Zoom. What kind of things might you do to ensure equitable participation? Uh, what I have in mind, I personally saw somebody drop for, but for a Zoom call. Uh, at a hearing, a uh, defendant, he was never able to get back on, and the judge issued a decision without a hear ever hearing from the defendant. And um, and the defendant was not able to find an attorney who would take his case and ask for a new hearing. What kind? Uh, and and I personally saw all of this. My question is, what would you do to uh, work around to ensure equitable? Uh, opportunities by Zoom? Yeah, it's a great question because that was one of the arguments raised when Zoom first started rolling out for the course. A lot of people just have, there's a gap of technology. Some people don't know how to use it or it's a little spotty or we'd have a lot of people trying to appear on Zoom. But, you know, if you're unhoused or something, you probably don't have a regular cell plan. So you're trying to get on the free Wi-Fi from the coffee shop or something. And it's a challenge. Um, I mean, I think it's good to, to let people at least have options. If they want to come into court, the courtroom doors are always open. You can't lock those doors or else that's a big problem too. 
Um, but for people who try to appear by Zoom and then have issues, it happens all the time. Like every time I have a Zoom hearing, somebody has an issue. And I'd be really concerned if a judge was um, making rulings without a defendant present who had been present and who was making efforts to appear. You know, in that case, I think unless there's some remarkably urgent thing, you got to set the hearing over and give them another chance. Yeah, well, uh, I'll talk to you. Maybe I should talk to you about this later. I'd like to know how to fix it. Thank you, Judy. Amanda, I think you are our last follow-up question. Over to you, Amanda. All right. This is a follow-up to um, number three and talking about um, the judgment and, and looking at racism. Can you talk about any specific things you're doing to continue your own education on these topics and to ensure your fairness and, um, and understanding bias? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I sign up for every training that we have. And one thing that I did have a big role in is at the district court. Unfortunately, I left right as this was getting going. Um, but we were partnering with Harvard University to study the bail decisions that judges at that court are making with regard to race. It's actually something we don't have any data on. It's with the systems that we have, it's very difficult to track even what the race of the people who come through court are. So we didn't have any tools for that. Uh, there was a lot of judges who were a little sensitive to even finding out those answers because the answers could be scary, but I think we have an obligation, especially if we have somebody willing to do it for us to find those answers, even if they're hard answers. And so right now Harvard is, has a giant fire hose of data that's coming out of the King County District Court and they're gonna crunch numbers and give judges feedback on it as they go so they can try to work to get better. I'm no longer in a role where I set bail, but if I were, I'd certainly wanna know the answer to that. Thank you so much. This concludes the end of our formal conversation with you and interview tonight. Thank you for such an informative and thoughtful discussion.